For the sins of the world His blood breaks the chain And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Oh, every knee will bow before Him So open up the gates Make way before the King of Kings Our God who comes to save Is here to set the captives free So who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion The Lion of Judah He's roaring with power And fighting our battles And every knee will bow before Him Our God For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the
So you love to jump rope. What is your record of number of times that you have jumped with your jump rope? 100. Um, my relationship with Jesus is um, that he's, um, that I knew him for a long time and that I read the Bible and I pray. Jesus changed my life because he died on the cross for me and he saved my soul. Our church is um, like the crafts that you get to do. These are really fun and I love the food there and I also love how my dad is a pastor in church and that's all. All creatures of a God and King Lift up your voice and with us sing Oh, praise Him, Alleluia, Thou burning sun with golden beam, Thou silver moon with softer gleam, Oh, praise Him, Oh, praise Him, Alleluia. rushing wind and thou rushing wind that art so strong ye clouds that sail in heaven alone oh praise him alleluia thou rising moon in praise rejoice ye lights of things their creator bless and worship him in humbleness oh praise him alleluia praise praise the father praise the son and praise the spirit three in one
Good morning, FBC. Good morning, church. Uh, before we jump into the sermon, which will be a little shorter today, you'll see why in a moment. We're going to take some time and just listen briefly to a conversation between Pastor Jerome and CJ, who's helped lead worship in the past, but especially this morning. Just talking about race and Jesus and where we're at in America. I think it's a very insightful conversation. I'm grateful to CJ and to others who are willing to have these conversations with our church and with us. So uh, without any further ado, CJ and Jerome, take it away. All right, well, here we are, FBC. Thanks, CJ, for being with us this morning and for leading worship. Uh, you know, it's, it's been, uh, we've been doing this for a long time, you and I. Yes. And uh, it's been how many years? About five years. Okay. Yeah, back at, back at CBC, you and I co-led. You were, uh, you were one of the key worship leaders on my team, and that was really fun. And uh, we've enjoyed having you guest lead a couple times here at FBC. And I know it's mostly been online because... For a good chunk of the time I've been at FBC, we've been in the COVID season, which has been yeah. quite interesting. Very. <laughs> and, uh, you know, CJ, you and I, we go back. I uh, really respect and love you as a sister in Christ, as a friend, and as a musical colleague. And, um, you know, I've asked you to talk with me a little bit about some of the hard conversations that we need to be having as a church, uh, especially particularly regarding race. So I do really thank you for having that conversation. And so I'm just going to open it up and say, you know, what what do you feel like you is on your heart right now in terms of where what we need to be listening for as a church? All right. So thank you for having me, first of all. Um, and as you know, I was raised a little differently um, in the United States of America. So I was raised in South Florida by old school Jamaican parents. Um, they did not believe that we were in the United States. Um, I begged them all the time when I would go to school for pizza and uh, you know any, anything that was American <laughs> and uh, they just weren't having it. So all of my morals and my values and uh, my rules and anything that we did was Jamaicanized. All right, and so um, I grew up going to a public school, um, learning very basic things about history, about science, um, whatever was integrated um, in the schools. Uh, and, and funny enough, when I was a youngster in school, we were still reading the Bible and praying in the public school, believe it or not, and I'm gonna touch on that in a minute. Uh, so somewhere around middle school, high school, uh, they got rid of that. All right, and um, I went to a diverse high school. Everybody was there. So when I would go home, we didn't really have the need to discuss anything that was happening uh, because my school was diverse and it, and it seemed like everybody got along, you know, for the most part. Uh, but also because my parents came from Jamaica to the States, um, they didn't know much about racism. They didn't know that depending on the shade of their skin, the color of their skin, and therefore uh, so on and so forth, that they were looked at differently. They didn't experience any type of racism until they touched foot on the United States soil. So I was raised differently. I didn't hear all of the things that we are hearing today. Um, and that's just truth. So throughout my high school years and uh, into college, you know, you're embedded with what you have learned as a child. And that's period. So I was just taught to love everybody and everybody's good. You know what I mean? Um, but most importantly, I was in church about six days a week. <laughs> and I just knew that God's way is the way. And that's the only way that we are going to ever survive. That's the only way that we will live eternally. That's the only way that um, we can get to heaven. That is the only way that um, anything that is of wrongdoing in the world will cease. That is the only way, period. And like I said, I learned a lot of this in school as well because we were reading the Bible and, and praying um, in schools. And so uh, now where we are at today in, in 2020 and in the years before, um, I am learning and teaching myself about racism because I just didn't experience it 
I didn't hear about it in my household, um, and it wasn't a subject. Uh, but I can tell you this, now that I am mindful of it, and I'm aware of it, and I know what's going on, and I've, I've read history books, and I've seen what's happened in the last, let's say, 20 years, okay, um, my final thought is this. The country has turned their back on God, and therefore there is evil. Now, has there always been evil? We see that in the Bible, of course, right? It's, it's from the beginning. We can, we can find racism or um, social injustice or, um, you know, you're from this tribe and I'm from this tribe in the Bible. It's in there. But if you remember what I said, we've turned our backs. And when I was a child, I read the Bible in school. And so we no longer have that. Um, and it starts from the top, right? So we can start with our leadership in the government all the way down. We have turned our backs against God and our hearts are evil. And so therefore there is sin in this world. And I believe that is why we're seeing a lot of what we're seeing today. Uh, I do feel that the church needs to do more than step up. We can talk about stepping up all we want, um, but how do you do that? And we spoke briefly on that as well. You can throw your money to this organization, this one, and this one. However, what is your relationship with people of color? And it it's not just... Um, black Americans, but how about everybody else? So we have a variety of people here in the San Francisco Bay Area, and are we loving on them the same as well? Because if we think about it, there are certain injustices to them as well. So I feel that the church needs to open up and not tippy-toe around subjects and just say, okay, we've done our part. We have posted something on social media, um, and it's a little quieter in the news, so let's move on. We're back to studying James chapter one, or whatever it is. Um, we have to have relationships with people, and I feel that when we do that, and we um, put aside our differences, and we come alongside people who don't look like us, talk like us, um, et cetera, that is the only time that we will be able to move forward. That's, that's what I believe. Well, Pastor Dave, I, I don't know that you need to preach a sermon now because <laughs> uh, I think we just, we had uh, a pretty good word here. I think that about wraps it up. No, I'm just um, you know, CJ, that is, there's a lot there. There's a lot there to unpack. Um, wow. I, I, could, I could probably spend a couple of weeks unpacking all of those different things that you said. And it's just, the, the thing that I personally keep learning the most in this time is for me to mostly just listen. Yes. And so being here listening to you is helping me understand more. I've just learned, I literally, we've already had this conversation, and I literally just learned way more than even the conversation we had offline. So, and I'm going to ask, I'm going to say what I'm hearing you say, and then I want you to reflect back at me so that I'm not, not saying what you're not saying. What I'm hearing you say is that the relationship piece, especially for the church, mm -hmm. is maybe the most important part right now. In terms of it, more important than yes, you know, and we should find things to, to give our money to and our resources to, and we are praying about that and we're looking. But the relationship piece, um, do you have anything more on that in terms of I mean engaging relationships with people who are not like and, and, and doing it in a way that's not disingenuous, where it's like, well, I'm going to find a token person from this tribe or this place, you know what I mean? Um, yes. What, what, what would you say to us or me or any of us who are wondering, how do we do that better? Well, the first thing is what you're doing. You're just simply asking, you know, is it okay? Can I just have a little chat with you? So you, you know me, but it could still be uncomfortable, you know, to... to speak with me and say, okay, I know CJ, she's black. Oh, but you know, it's a little touchy time we're in, which it is, right? But unless you try, you'll never know, right? You try, try again, right? You'll never know if I will want to talk about it or not. And so I, I had someone last week just kind of reach out 
and um, they were chatting with, to me about other things, and then they just said, hey, how are you feeling about everything? So in other words, hey, I'm here to listen. So I, I, I believe that that is genuine, and you're not just looking for a token child, a token black child, I'll say it, <laughs> it's all right, you know, to just try to get some information out of. Uh, there, there might be um, someone on your street that you, hi, how you doing, you know, and you see them all the time, but you just feel you don't have anything in common with them. Well, have you ever, you know, gone past that, you know, to uh, say, hey, I saw you had, had um, kids, how old are they, or, um, hey, how are you feeling during this time? You know, it's almost, it is a touchy time to ask questions and to pinpoint things, but then at the other end of it, it's a perfect time to say, hey, you know, I know this might be out of the blue, John, but I just want to know, how are you doing? Like, seriously, how are you doing? I'm here to listen. I want to know. I want to understand. That's good. Well, you know, CJ, if, uh, I would like to close this in prayer. And what I'd like to say is I'd like, I'd like this to be an open conversation. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to revisit this. Not just with you personally, but just you know, even here at FBC and whenever you whenever you want to. Um, and and I think as we as we both are committed to building the kingdom of God on earth, that's something that we've also talked about. Um, some of that is hard. Some of that is engaging the hard stuff. So we want to keep this going. We we, we want to keep listening and learning. And uh, I and I I even think that I'm gonna personally. I think I'll stumble sometimes. I'll say the wrong thing, or I might not. Or I might not. I might be too afraid to say something, so I might stumble. But then I'm going to get up and I'm going to ask for forgiveness and say, "Help me with this," yeah. you know, um, and uh, and directing that really to the Holy Spirit as well. So, Lord, help me with this. Um, help me in this time. Help me not to shy away from the stuff that you have for me in the church to to engage. That's important because uh, you know, even if you're um, breaking bread with someone or saying, "Hey, uh, can I?" treat you to some coffee or can we go and get coffee and just chat for a little bit and before you um, enter that uh, situation you can just ask the Holy Spirit to give you the words as to what to say it's in the Bible that he will help you he, he will help you speak and you can pray for your words to be seasoned with salt um, and just to say the right thing you know and know that if you do stumble it's okay ask for forgiveness and keep the dialogue going, you know. Um, it's very, very important for people to just uh, not assume and simply listen during this time. And uh, as you can see, my view on it is not what everybody else thinks, okay? So outside of the fact that uh, I am a Christian, so I'm thinking that first. What would Jesus do during this time? Okay, so let's all stop and think about that for a moment, right? And then secondly, I was raised differently. So it's, it's kind of interesting that I'm educating myself on all of this now. Uh, however, I have to bring it back to the Bible. It's, it's very simple for me, you know? We're supposed to treat each other as we want to be treated. We need to think of what Jesus did in the New Testament, we have to ask ourselves, what would Jesus do during this time? He had relations with people. It's just, just that simple, really. He, he sought after people who nobody wanted to go and talk to. Now, I'm not saying that nobody wants to come and talk to black people, but you know, they were hard conversations that I'm sure he had with folks um, when, we, when we think about it, right? Okay, well, CJ, again, I really appreciate you being with us and I really appreciate uh, you doing this with me. And uh, we will continue this, like I said, and everything else that we've been doing too, as, as, a, as kind of a team, uh, we will continue doing as well. So I'm excited about that. And um, is it okay if I close the prayer? Yes. All right. Let's pray, church. Father, thank you so much for this time. Lord, I pray that as a church and your people, we would be listening, um, and that we would listen to each other, that we would engage um, in conversations, and that, Lord, you would teach us, Jesus, how to love and to see everyone through your eyes, what that actually practically means. You would teach us that um, as we are here on earth and we are in a tough time, but again, a time where you are 
doing something, you are bringing things to light, um, and it's all for your glory, and you are doing your will, and we trust that. And we know that you're sovereign, and we love you, and that's what this is all about. That's why we're here. So Jesus, once again, we bring this back to you. We point this back to you. You get all the glory for all of this, and we lay it all before your feet. In your precious name, Jesus, amen. Hey again, church. Thank you, CJ. Thank you so much, Jerome. Well done. Thank you uh, for giving us your insight, CJ. Thank you for uh, telling us about your story, your experience growing up in South Florida. And um, thank you for your calling all of us to, to trust Jesus and to remind us that um, our only hope is Him in light of what we're experiencing as a nation, even as little uh, areas of our nation. So thanks again. Um, we're going to take a pivot in our kingdom Sorry, our Citizens of Heaven series. Uh, we're still going to be there because I'm going to talk about that, but I'm going to be in the book of James just briefly. This will be a different 4th of July or 5th of July type sermon. Uh, my time is limited, and I thought it was important as your pastor to sit and just maybe uh, let you know some of the things that I and we've been wrestling with. So I'm going to pray briefly, and we'll jump into a few chapters in the book of James and see what the Lord has for us this morning. So let's pray. Father, help us. Uh, we cry out as a church, as people, as a nation. Uh, we pray for healing and for insight and wisdom. We pray for grace. We pray that all of us would have ears to hear, eyes to see what you're doing in a um, maybe a confusing time in our nation. Help me speak well. Help me speak the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Book of James quickly, chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the uh, dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Verse 4, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without approach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Well, happy 4th of July weekend, happy 5th of July today. And uh, the thought that's been going in my mind as a 44-year-old American pastor Christian is how do I reconcile what I know and love and feel and revere about this country with some of the actual history that our country has lived out? Um, The reason I think there's so much passion and anger and tension and rage and confusion, I could put a lot of other words in there, in our nation over the last six weeks. Some of it's obvious. Some of the injustice we see, some of the racism we've seen, some of the rioting and destruction of property, some of that is obvious why we get upset at that. But I was thinking and praying this week and listening to other pastors whom you'll hear about in a moment and reading, and though we have many disagreements politically, um, ideologically in some ways, and some even theologically, we can sit and disagree on certain things. The one thing that we as Americans, and maybe we as people, hate most is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy and the hatred or loathing of it, I think, is a uniter in many ways. When I became a Christian many years ago, I was mentored, and my mentor said, As long as you live, you will be a recovering hypocrite. Because we do see hypocrisy in the church and some hypocrisy with Christians. But with Christ, we can work on that. We can grow out of our hypocritical nature. And I think it is nature. There are many things we disagree on, like I said. But hypocrisy, when we write post, say, or stand for something and live almost the complete opposite, 
That really upsets people. Hypocrisy, I looked it up this week, is the practice of claiming to have moral standards or beliefs to which one's own behavior does not conform. There it is. And Jesus spoke a lot about hypocrisy, but namely in his Sermon on the Mount, he said, do not be like the hypocrites. When they give, they go, look how much I'm giving. That is the exact opposite of what we're to do when we're to be charitable. Do not be like the hypocrites when they pray. They stand on boxes in the corner and say, look how spiritual I am. Jesus says, don't do that. Go to your secret place. Pray to your heavenly Father in secret, and he will answer you, for he knows what you need before you ask. America is 244 years old. That's what we have celebrated this last week. And in that history, the proclamation in which the way she started is beautiful. The writings and the thoughts and the wantings of our founding fathers were dynamic and wonderful. Namely, life, liberty, and justice for all. Those thoughts and those theories have, in a good way, persuaded many democracies in the last 200 years around the world, and they've taken from those and wanted to do the same. Life, liberty, and justice for all. But the actuality of America in its 244-year-old life or history, we still have a lot of growing to do. We are still a young nation. A gentleman named Carlos Whitaker reminded me of that this week. He had a six or seven minute um, Instagram live or TV, basically he, saying he, he's a black man. He loves America, but we still must grow in many ways, and I agree with him. This is my own interpretation of when he called us a baby or a young nation. I believe in the history of histories, as we look throughout the world's history, America being 244 years old puts us somewhere in between 4th and 7th grade, in my mind, between the ages of 9 or 12 years old. Now here's the question. How much have you changed and how much have I changed since our 10th birthdays? And the answer is... We've changed in almost every way. As CJ mentioned a few moments ago in our interview, we do learn most of what we believe at a very early age. That's proven. That's why we can say almost everything changes about us after we become 10 years old and we grow, but some things are still there. If I've lost you during this time of our teaching, I'm sorry. That was not my intent. But I've been wrestling with this notion of what I love about America, which is a lot, and what I want to see change in America, which is a lot. I'm going to read a speech that was given on July 5th, 1852, at least portions of it. It was given by Frederick Douglass. If you're not familiar with him, he was a social reformer, an abolitionist, an orator, a writer, and a statesman. After escaping slavery himself in Maryland, he became a national leader of the abolitionist movement in Massachusetts and New York, gaining note or notoriety for his oratory and his extremely intense anti-slavery writings. Accordingly, he was described by abolitionists in his time as living as the counterexample to slaveholders' arguments that black people lacked the intellectual capacity to function as independent American citizens. Slaveholders believed that. That was one of their tenets they stood on. And Frederick Douglass flipped that on its head because he was brilliant. And if, you re- if you've ever read or heard some of his speeches, You'll know that right away. July 5th, 1852, part of his speech. Fellow citizens, I am not writing in respect for the fathers of this republic. The signers of the Declaration of Independence were brave men. 
They were great men, too, great enough to give frame to a great age. It does not often happen to a nation to rise at one time such a number of truly great men. The point from which I am compelled to view them is not certainly the most favorable, and yet I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less admiration. They were statesmen, patriots, and heroes, and for all for the good they did, and the principles they contended for, I will unite with you to honor their memory. Uh, from the article I read, a commentary, Douglas states that the nation's founders are great men for their ideals for freedom, but in doing so, brings awareness to the hypocrisy of their ideals with the existence of slavery on American soil. Douglas continues to interrogate the meaning of the Declaration of Independence in the speech to enslaved African Americans experiencing grave inequality and injustice. Back to Douglas's speech. Fellow citizens, pardon me, allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? Again, this is July 5th. 1852. What have I, or those I represent, to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and, natu and of natural justice embodied in that the Declaration of Independence, are they extended to us? And am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and confess the benefits and express Devout, gr sorry, devout gratitude for the blessing resulting from your independence to us. In other words, he's saying what? Why am I here? Am I here to pretend that I and the people like me have independence on July 5th, 1852? He goes on to say this. Would to God, both for your sakes and ours, that an affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to these questions. Then would my task be light and my burden easy and delightful. For who is there so cold that a nation's sympathy could not warm him? Who so obdurate and dead to claim the claims of gratitude? that would not thankfully acknowledge such priceless benefits. Who should stolid and selfish, that would not grieve his own voice to swell the hallelujahs of the nation's jubilee when the chains of servitude had been torn from his limbs? I am not that man. In a case like that, the dumb might eloquently speak and the lame might leap as heart. In the final portion here. But such is not the state of the case. I say it with a sad sense of the disparity between us. I am not included within the pale of the glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us, he says. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought the light and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, but I must mourn. Again, Frederick Douglass, July 5th, 1852. This speech, uh, spoken by a brilliant man, a former slave who became abolitionist, speaks directly to the hypocrisy that America is. Again, the ideals and the idea and the experiment that our country was founded on is glorious, divine in many ways, but the way it's played out has not been so. I had the privilege of listening to a discussion this week 
between a black pastor and two white pastors. They're all here locally. And uh, they talked about John 11 and some other uh, scriptures where Jesus mourned and he entered into the humanity and the suffering of, of people, their plight. It was a good discussion. But then the black pastor kind of, uh, his name's Herman Hamilton, he, he kind of encapsulated the end of the discussion with this. He says to the other two, he will have two or three encounters a week dealing with race that his uh, white counterparts won't have. He described one walking to the corner grocery store. Uh, he's been watched and looked at more seriously than other p- patrons that are there buy things, and he knows that. He describes being in an elevator and having a, a lady, a young lady or a, any lady, grab a purse or a backpack uh, more tightly when he walks in. And the other two pastors said that they've never experienced that, nor have I. Now, in closing, uh, Pastor Hamilton said this, he does not want his fellow white pastors or congregants or brothers and sisters or white friends to feel guilty or ashamed of the past or the actions he described. He simply wants those pastors and those friends and those congregants to be aware that this is how he lives and this is how other people of color live in our modern day society. These incidents upset him. Uh, They make him angry, which is understandable. But Pastor Hamilton also wants others to start to see this and become righteously upset as well. He is praying that God himself, the Spirit, would activate, that was his word, all people, so when we see this, we might say something, or enter in, in a humble way, he says, to speak about these types of injustices that still go on. His advice was for people to listen to the pain and trauma of our culture in recent past, but also now. He also said he would advise all people to lament, to sit, to to think, to to grieve over the injustice that we have witnessed and that we know about. It was a very insightful interview. He then makes a disclaimer. He says that the black people in his congregation, the black people he know, they're not homogenous. There's different opinions and different understandings of of the situation, both in the recent past and in, in what's going on now. But this is his opinion as a black pastor in the Bay Area. After praying and thinking and even reading some of James and part of the, uh, the chapter in Philippians I was going to try and teach, I, I, I try and be optimistic. I think uh, at times I'm pessimistic about sports and about the Giants at times and different things that don't matter. But with life I try, excuse me, be an optimist. I do see this as a beautiful time in our nation's history. America has been in Indeed, I'm sorry, America has indeed been founded on ideals and principles that soar to the heavens, that have done so much good in parts of our country and in the world. You've got to know that and see that. But we've fall, fallen short as a country in executing those principles and ideals. To want to simply destroy those principles and ideals, to simply want to burn them down is intellectually dishonest, and believe it or not, intellectually lazy. The goal has been placed there. And some of the men God used to write those goals were slave owners, which is something that's really hard to come to grips with. But the goal is still there. Life, liberty, justice for all. Why I say this is a beautiful time is that we as a nation and as Christians, we can acknowledge our struggling ways in America. We can acknowledge our hypocrisy and we can choose to burn it down or we can choose to shoot and remake a culture and a society in a way where Christ would be honored. Life, liberty, and justice for all 
I believe, are divine mantras. And why I say this is a beautiful time is because people of all ages, all races, and even all religions are being awakened to this notion that we can change things. Growth and change are there for the taking. It is possible, church. Now, as Christians, we have a supreme privilege. As we learned the last two weeks, we have the mind of Christ. Paul tells us that. Philippians 2.5 Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in meekness or lowliness or humility, think of others more intently or more intensely than you think of yourself. Think of their needs and see how you can impact their lives as servant. In closing, um, Pastor Jerome, myself, the board, and others, uh, our church, we want to be a suburb of heaven. I heard it said this week, an outpost for the gospel. We want the kingdom be, to be shown here. We want to lead you to engage our congregation in more dialogues, more learning, more listening, and action. We want to be change agents. We don't want to simply sit in a bunker and see the world going around. We want to enter. So if, you, if the Spirit is showing you things, if you're learning things, if God is growing and moving in your heart, please reach out to us. We are in this with you. We want to stand arm in arm and walk uh, into this, in many ways, new chapter once the pandemic quiets down where we can gather and strategize and pray and mobilize and love the world the way Christ has loved us. We have one more song. Uh, CJ, I believe, is going to help lead on that as well. Uh, it's been a joy to, to be with you just for a, a few brief moments this morning. The sun's creeping into me, so I know that's time to go. We love you. God bless you. May God bless you and keep you and move in your heart. And uh, we'll continue to update you on the things that are going on. And we'll continue to update you on when we can actually see each other face to face. Let me pray, church, and uh, I'll get out of here. Father, help us. Help us to see with wisdom and insight. I didn't really get to it, but let us ask for wisdom, Lord, from you. If we're lacking, Lord, let us ask for wisdom divine wisdom to navigate the season and the times we're in. Father, thank you for this country. Father, uh, forgive us for our shortcomings in the way we've taken advantage of people uh, throughout the years. But don't leave us there, Lord. Unite us under humility and peace and kindness and love. And then may we get a glimpse of you almost in a prophetic way to reimagine what this next chapter of our nation and what a, our state and our local communities could look like. May we live under the banner of the love of Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice and his great love. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, FBC. We'll see you soon.
Great are you, Lord, and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. You are more. 
one more You're more than we can imagine 